Chapter 49, Dangerous Territory November 21, 2002 One year of walking and the day that I announced my relationship with Alberto to one of my cousins, knowing that it would reach the ears of my family. It wasn't the bold step I had wanted to take, but at least it was a step. We continued our walk, much to my family's disappointment, who had wanted us to spend the Christmas holidays with them. But we needed to go on. Our route brought us back to the coast, where we passed Batrun and the historic Phoenician city of Byblos, believed to be one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, and pressed on to Juni, on the doorsteps of Beirut. That night, a torrential thunderstorm lashed the hotel where we were staying, and was still going strong the following morning. Let's practice stopping the rains, Alberto suggested. Whereas a few short weeks earlier, that phrase would have sent me into an emotional frenzy, I now found myself responding, how shall we do it? I love you, Alberto replied, grinning widely. Just do what feels natural. Remember, you are one with the elements, not separate from them. Let that feeling lead you. It took a long time for me to overcome my own sense of ridicule, but I eventually did, and began to mentally repeat the words, I and the elements are one. I recalled Paulo Coelho's book, The Alchemist, where the young boy Santiago speaks with the elements. It had captivated me then because it had seemed such a fantastic yet wholly natural thing to do. I imagined myself to be Santiago and said the words that came into my mind at that moment. Brother Wind, Sister Rain, you and I are one. We are created by the same hand and all are living God's will. Thank you for cleansing the earth and for nourishing the soil. Thank you for sweeping away the dead and the decaying and refreshing the land and the air. You are doing God's work. You are living your purpose. I too am living my purpose and need your help to fulfill it. I trembled from the energy that coursed through my body feeling its power but missing the loving sensations that usually accompanied it. I wasn't sure what was happening but didn't stop, my curiosity now leading me. I ask that you hold your nourishing rains and purifying winds until we finish walking. Thank you. My will is your will, I heard Alberto pronounce in a low, deep voice that was filled with authority. I am not afraid of making a mistake. You and I are one. I trust in the purity of my intention. I choose weather conditions that allow us to walk comfortably and complete our mission today. My will is your will. When I finally opened my eyes, I saw a confident Alberto looking out the window. The waters were turbulent and the skies a dark gray. Patches of rain intermittently came down. Let's go, he announced. But it's still stormy, I protested. Faith, he pronounced, preparing his backpack. We walked under light showers, not heavy enough to make a stop, but steady enough that I needed to keep my head down. I knew this wouldn't work, I thought disparagingly. Almost imperceptibly, however, the rains began to ease, and within half an hour of our walking, completely stopped. The dark clouds began to disperse, until miraculously the sun peeked out. You're a great wizard, Alberto teased. It was probably all you, I replied, unsure of what to make of it. No, he affirmed, you just don't believe enough in yourself yet. Before the Civil War, Beirut was a cosmopolitan city that was described as the Paris of the Middle East. The various religious communities coexisted, freedom of expression and tolerance were celebrated. The Civil War revealed deeper schisms that the veneer of Beirut hid, and ahead lay the task of rebuilding the physical and emotional fabric of this city. Construction was plainly in evidence wherever we walked, but I wondered if the city's deeper wounds had been similarly healed or simply built over. The beauty of Beirut receded, and the freshly paved asphalt highway that we were walking 
became a torn up road. Partially constructed buildings, most unpainted and with the cement still exposed, filled the landscape on either side of the road. It was hard to believe we were only a few kilometers south of Beirut. Curious eyes now became suspicious. Those who made eye contact, I greeted in the traditional Muslim manner of Assalamu Alaikum, but did not wait for a response. Most responded automatically, but their gaze burned against my neck. Posters started appearing along our path, proclaiming death to Israelis and their allies. The majority carried the name of Hezbollah, meaning party of God. Many posters featured Muslim clerics denouncing injustice and calling men and women to arms for the liberation of their Palestinian brothers. I quietly raged at the mixing of religion with politics, but also felt afraid. In the glossy beauty of Beirut, it was easy to forget that this was a city almost felled to the ground by the civil war. I had felt the disparity between rich and poor, Christian and Muslim, when we were in the north of Lebanon. But now, the further south we went, the more evident it was, and the more radical the solutions being heralded. For the first time, I realized I was walking on land that had felt the rumble of tanks through its fields and tasted the blood of innocence. My fear intensified with every step. Alberto and I stopped at our roadside cafe to rest, our sign facing outwards. Two men at a nearby table kept glancing over and whispering. Finally, one of them turned around and speaking in English spat out, go tell the Americans about peace, not us. I momentarily froze at the sudden outburst. Both men looked to be in their forties and had the typical dark Arab features. One was dressed in slacks and a t-shirt, but the one who spoke sported black slacks, black shirt, and a colored tie. A diamond-studded gold watch glittered in the light. You are judging us before even knowing us, Alberto replied with calm authority. We would be happy to sit with you and share our story. The men stared hard at us for a moment and then invited us to their table. With introductions made, we began to share the nature of our walk. We are not carrying the sign as a message to the Muslims, Alberto declared, impressing me with his confidence and directness. We are carrying a message of peace for the world, based on seeking inner peace to create outer peace. The men quickly agreed, saying that the Quran also speaks of seeking this inner peace. This is not about individuals creating peace though, one insisted. It is about politics, and American policies that prevent us from having peace. We are a peaceful people. We want to live in peace, but we cannot sit idly by while we are being attacked in our own homes. Openly weeping, he went on to describe massacres and other atrocities committed against the mainly Shiite Muslim population in this area by Israelis, Americans, and Lebanese Christians. Hezbollah is only defending our land and our people. He asserted, they are not murderers and terrorists. They are only responding to the injustice and the terrorism committed against them. They are educated, well-informed professionals from all walks of life. It was they, not diplomacy, who pushed the Americans out of here. They responded to force with force. I was in an uncomfortable territory, facing every belief that I had grown up with. I believed so deeply that peace began within, but did not know how to extrapolate that belief to peace among nations. What words could possibly bridge my truth to these men's reality? How can I make this inner message of peace relevant to the outer world? How can my experiences of peace be relevant to them? You empower what you fight against, Alberto stated. I understand why you want to use force to stop force, but I no longer believe that's the answer. I read somewhere that an eye for an eye will eventually leave everyone blind. We have lived very intense experiences, and in every situation where we fought against what we don't want, we only made it stronger. Alberto went on to share his personal experiences in Turkey, 
how in his attempt to fight and control the difficult situations, he only attracted more of them. It was a very candid discussion, an exchange that I never would have imagined possible with men who held such extremist views. I wasn't sure that we had changed their ideas about conspiracy theories and the need for radical action, but I was certain that we had touched them personally. Somewhere in that exchange, I hoped that the message of peace would work its way into their lives. We finally stood to leave, mentioning our excitement at crossing this final border into Israel and reaching Jerusalem. The border is closed, one said. You will not be able to cross there. If you would like, we can get you into Israel. We know people in Hezbollah who can smuggle you into the Palestinian side without a problem. I thanked him for his generous offer, but told him we preferred to cross legally. They left us with their phone numbers should we require help in this part of the country and asked us to pray for them in Jerusalem. Among other things, our meeting did make me reflect on whether we needed a more universal message of peace, one that better communicated our intentions. Alberto and I spoke about it, and we finally agreed to use the symbol of peace, the pitchfork in a circle. When later we were asked if we were Americans, we decided to walk without a sign, because it seemed that whatever we carried was open to misinterpretation. Onwards we pressed past the coastal cities of Damur, Sidon, and Tyre, ever deeper into Hezbollah territory. At times I felt like we were sitting ducks, passing through heavily militarized areas, uncertain of who the enemy was. We did meet many people, all of whom supported our walk and intentions for peace, and who kept reassuring us that we were safe. Hezbollah is not roaming the streets shooting people indiscriminately, a young Palestinian man we had befriended one day stated. It's true that their military wing carries out attacks into Israel, but the others are people of great influence who are highly respected here. Ask for help, and you will receive it. My perception of Hezbollah was still heavily skewed by how they are portrayed in the media, but I was opening to an aspect of them I had never considered. I did not agree with their military attacks or the mixing of religion and politics, but decided that I would keep an open mind should an occasion ever arise to ask for their help.